Good evening, everybody. I'm so pleased that you made it despite the rain. I know that's always a deterrent. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and I want to start acknowledging with all of you that we are gathered on the traditional land of Cherokee, Shawnee, Miami, and Osaga tribes and invite you to please join us in acknowledging these communities, their past, present, and future. At the Speed Art Museum, we know that we are a symbol and beneficiary of the colonization that resulted in the exclusion, displacement, and erasure of native people, including those on whose land we are now located. We are committed to work towards reversing this exclusion and erasure and inviting native people to tell their own stories, rituals, and belief through art and programs. I also wanted you to know that we are partnering with the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission for future events to connect us to our, more to our local native community. And last fall, we started the urgent work of reinstalling and re er, reinterpreting our Native American collection. And we are very honored to be working with a distinguished advisory council, including Dr. Miranda Roberts, an enrolled member of the Yerington Paiute tribe in Nevada, Mrs. Doreen Redcloud, an enrolled member of the Oglala Zoo tribe, and Dr. Anya Montiel, a member of the Tohono O'odham nation. And I'm very honored um, to host Guy Hopinka here tonight, an artist and filmmaker who is a member of the Ho-Chang Nation in Wisconsin and a descendant of the Pechanga Band of Louisiana people in California. And I also want to invite all of you, of course, to join us Sunday at one o'clock for a screening of Sky's feature film, uh, Mothni, Towards the Ocean, Towards the Shore. And it's such a pleasure to have you here this evening. Your work is so imaginative and powerful and inspirational and the way you center Native American experiences of today um, is, is really remarkable and I hope that we can all learn from them and be inspired by them. So um, please, Tyler, Tyler Blackwell, come up to enjoy, uh, to enjoy, to introduce our guest. Hi everyone, Ooh. if we have not met yet, my name is Tyler Blackwell. I am the Curator of Contemporary Art here at The Speed. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all um, and to spend time with you on this rainy evening. Um, I'm also so thrilled that Sky is here uh, with us this evening. Um, this is Sky's first trip to Louisville and his first to Kentucky, and I joked with him earlier that there would be many people here in the audience that are bourbon experts and enthusiasts. So if you get the chance to talk with Sky, then please lay down your knowledge on Mr. Hopinka. He's ready for it. I see him nodding at me. Um, <clears throat> the exhibition Current Speed Sky Hopinka is on view upstairs on the second floor of this building uh, for just 11 more days. I know, I hear the, the sounds of disbelief. I too am in disbelief. Um, the presentation features three recent short films by the artists and I really encourage you to go and sit in the darkened gallery space um, and let these experimental films sort of wash over you, the sounds, the sights, um, the feelings that they evoke. Um, I encourage you to spend time um, to sit quietly, sit with yourself um, and sit with these films. Um, and I also want to acknowledge here that this presentation would not be possible without the support of uh, Leslie and James Millar, um, who are very generously, yes, there they are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we would not be able to make this presentation presentation possible. This is the first iteration of the current speed series, and I just want to mention that the current that current speed, as we're referring to it, is a new series of changing contemporary art exhibitions that introduces the Kentuckiana community to new and emerging artists, as well as celebrated mid-career artists previously underrecognized, underexplored in the region. So, um, in that sense, Sky is the first um, in this series. So. We're honored and thrilled um, 
And just as Rafaela mentioned, um, I want to direct your attention to the free screening um, again, just to reiterate. Uh, this Sunday at one o'clock um, of one of Sky's. So the films upstairs are short films, short films, um, and then the film that will be screening in the Speed's Magnificent Cinema is a feature-length film, um, and it will be free of charge this Sunday at one o'clock. So make sure to reserve your ticket online. Um, now on to our guests, and Sky, this is a very long bio because you are a very accomplished man. <laughs> Um, Sky Hopinka makes experimental films, videos, and photographs that center and explore indigenous perspectives, memory, and culture. A member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin and a descendant of the Pechanga Band of Luisiano Indians, Sky interweaves personal and communal histories and experiences as visual, linguistic, and, and sonic ingredients to create an alternative form of storytelling that is often unfixed, inexact, and indirect. Through technical mastery and precision in film editing, the artist destabilizes and untethers our conventional linear viewing experiences, creating uncertainty that might mirror the myriad ways generations of indigenous peoples have been also disenfranchised from their own firmly planted lands, homes, and familial ties to culture, identity, and personhood. Sky is currently an assistant professor in the film and electronic arts program at Bard College. He's exhibited work in screened films at venues including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the San Jose Museum, this is where it gets long, the San Jose Museum of Art, the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, the Hessel Museum of Art in Annadale on Hudson in New York, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the St. Louis Art Museum, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley, the Whitney, LACMA, the MCA Chicago, and the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, among like hundreds of others. Um, <clears throat> among uh, some of his honors recently includes a Forge Project Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship for the Creative Arts, a Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study Fellowship at Harvard, an Art Matters Artist Fellowship, Sundance Art of Nonfiction Fellowship, Filmmaker Magazine, 25 New Faces of Film, the Chicago Underground Film Festival, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, in October 22, um, just weeks before his presentation opened here at the Speed, Sky was named a MacArthur Genius Fellow. Yeah. So in that sense, we are completely honored and thrilled um, that Sky is spending his evening with us um, to talk about his practice and to talk a little bit about the films that are upstairs. Um, everyone, please welcome Sky Hopinka. Hello. It's really good to be here. Um, yeah, I've never been here before, and a big part of my practice is wandering around the country, wandering through landscapes with my camera, with my sound recorder, with my pen, just trying to understand these histories that exist in this land, in these lands, in these different ideas of homeland. And that question of homeland is one that has followed me through most of my life. My my father, his tribe is from Wisconsin, and my mother, her tribe is from Southern California. And I was born in Northern Washington. Um, how did they get there? I don't know. Um, well, actually, they actually met on the powwow trail. My mom was a dancer, my dad was a singer, and so I guess those things go together pretty well, and I'm what you call a powwow baby. Um, but growing up in the Northwest, I was often reminded in good ways in complicated ways, in strong ways, that I'm not from that homeland. I'm not from the Northwest. I'm not Lummi. And there are certain things that I had access to being a Native person, being an American Indian, being indigenous, but there were a lot of things that I didn't have access to not being Lummi. And being, having that barrier reinforced, those boundaries reinforced at an early age or established was really important for how I began to understand so many different parts of how we as Native people are recognized and understood in this culture, in American culture, in Western culture, through anthropology, ethnography, 
even pop culture. Um, there's a lot of pressure that's put on us to either fall into these different categories of, of being, well, I, 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 I once said to a friend, like the thing that people want from Indians is to either be crying, dying, or frying. Um, the crying Indian, like um, uh, uh, the, the, the famous uh, person that was crying on the side of the road in litter in the 70s at campaign, dying, the ones that were killed by the cowboys in the late 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, you can go on, and frying, how we make fry bread on reservations and powwows and, um, you know, just sort of like welcoming to all and how we have these different spectacles of our events. And so, like, there's a lot more to being an indigenous person, being a native person today. And I want to start with um, just reading this, uh, this, this sort of introduction to a poem that I wrote a few years ago called Perfidia. I'll talk more about Perfidia and how it fits into my work, but this is something I wrote as a beginning to, to, to that poem. This is a beginning that isn't a beginning. This is the youth, oh youth, and Franklin said, so what? A betrayal was acknowledged when Emerson wrote a letter to Van Buren and warned that the seat and seal will become an instrument of perfidy. It was neither the first nor the last in this country, this body of earth, but I didn't forget about you, our love, as you moved on and away back across the ocean, back across the sea, back across the spirit world into the land of the dead. Back to Castile and Aragon, where you don't think of we anymore. You've neglected our pain, you've ignored our children, you've discarded our dead. Back to King Louis, because you're the same. You've tussled our hair and tore at our trust and pushed us away and sold us out. Back to King George, you've taken our things and won't give them back. You came and you took and you made promises that sing and gave us a tongue bitter in taste, parched and thirsty. Broad Europe, you remain over there. You've forgotten my mother, my father, and my brother and sister who mourn every day. But we can't forget you as your violent emissaries remain. I'm not mad, I'm not angry, I'm not hurt. I'm just deeply troubled at heart. Maybe I'm lying. Maybe these words that follow are a way. Not the only way. Not the right way. Not a good way. But an empty way. Voided by language, voided by absence, void of trust. A hollow way being filled by those traumas I never wanted to be taught. Still, this earthly trauma begins with you. There you are, and hello, here I am, with this. Now, as the poem continues, it kind of moves through a certain sort of space of, of, of looking at relationships. Now, the beginning of that poem began with this idea I was thinking about Europeans, as one does. Um, I was thinking about them, I guess, in terms of like a, an ex or someone that used to date. It's like, do they still think about me? You know, and just like thinking about, you know, Europeans, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the, the English, the British. Like, do they still think about us after the colonies fell? I don't know. We think about them. And it's that sort of movement between space or between relationships or between histories that I'm really interested in exploring. And that is often through film and video, um, and more recently through photography and text. Now pictured here is an image from the installation at the, the Hessel Museum at Bard College. Um, installed as a, as a film I made called Dislocation Blues from 2017. And on the wall adjacent is a, a, a calligram of a myth. Now, when I first started making films, I was trying to answer a question, or actually, I was talking a lot of shit. Um, I was telling a friend of mine, you know, God, this movie sucks, this native movies, you know, just like, they're, they're, they're made for a white audience, you know, like, why is it this way, and why is it that way? And, and he said, well, it's better than your movie. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So, I don't know, that just kind of began like, thinking about like, what would it mean to make a movie? Or what does that look like? How hard is it? Or what does it mean to have a camera? I don't know, it was all kind of mystical to me at that point. I had no idea about iMovie or cameras or anything. But during the, the spring, my, friend and, my friends, just two of us, or three of us, we went to the Columbia River and we built a traditional fishing scaffold where we tried to catch salmon. And I had a little 
point and shoot power shoot camera with me um, with a very low quality video function and I began to record video of us building a fishing scaffold. And after like I you know had all this video, I was like, oh wait, I can make a movie. So I learned how to use iMovie and I read some blogs and I started editing this piece together where it was about not giving context. Where it's like I wanted to make this thing where it's just like three contemporary native people doing a very native thing and not explaining what we're doing. It's not that, that radical, I know, but what, for, for us it felt radical because a lot of the ways that were presented in media is through PBS documentaries, and those are great, or through historical films that touch on the beginning of the genocide for Native peoples, and those are important, or films that are focused on contemporary issues that have to do with trauma and poverty and reservations and health and all these different things, and that's important too. But the question was just like, how, where do we exist in all of this? How can we be part of this larger constellation of work that is defined by us, rather than that constellation being defined by the powers that be? And so it's like very simple to make this film. I mean, it's just like, it was, it was a bit silly. I put some music to it, it was good. I don't know, put it on Facebook, 2010. And that was, that was enough to get me going or to like keep on moving with the momentum of this idea, how can I make films? And how can I make the films that I wanna see? Now, it wasn't until 2013 when I decided to go to grad school um, that I found out what an experimental film was. Apparently, like, they, they, they saw my, my, my portfolio and they, they thought, it's experimental. But when I got there, I was like, what the hell is experimental film? You know, like, I, I never knew what that was. I didn't study film in college. I, you know, just kind of had, had seen things here and there. But there was something about the idea of experimental film that I thought was really appropriate for the things that I was interested in exploring. That being how to use the cinematic language to explore culture, language, heritage, identity in ways that I haven't seen before. Now like watching these films, like, you know, what from like, I hate listing names because I always forget, um, but James Benning, Hollis Frampton, Besma Al-Sharif, Joyce Whelan, Chantal Ackerman, and seeing what they do with the camera, seeing what they did with the editing approaches that were really about affect. About trying to make you things, make you feel things that weren't necessarily explained or laid out, or A plus B equals C, or three act structure. It's like, I can, I can do something like this for, for native film, or I can use these tools to apply to the work that I'm interested in making, because ultimately the thing that I realized is no one's gonna ask me to make the films that I wanna make. It's often the way that it is for a lot of funding in the United States for indigenous arts, for Native American arts, for American Indian arts. There's very few resources, and those very few resources have clear agendas, goals, that they need to fulfill, and that's good. But where's the area, again, for the places in between those big, broad concepts that we're all familiar with? And so I began making films through translation, through language acquisition. There was, a, there was something about learning Chinook Wawa, this native language that's indigenous to the Portlands, and having picked up a camera around the same time, honestly within months of each other, those two events, that really formulated how those things can coexist. There's a film that I made in 2013, 14 called Wawa, which really kind of like explodes this idea of translation, of subtitles. And I got tired of seeing films growing up of like Tonto talk, you know? It sounds like a cave person. It sounds really dumb. It sounds really, I don't know, like that it, 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 it places us within a contemporary understanding of being of the past, historicizing us automatically. And it's just like finding text, you're just finding like, oh, people are eloquent. Native people can speak English really well, huh? Um, that really kind of like made me think more about subtitling and translation. And so within this piece, it's a five minute short, I don't have a clip for you. Um, but I, in the subtitles, I show the different options for language, the different options for what these words can mean, and they can mean a lot of different things. And so that points to the authority of the, of the subtitler, the translator. It points to the authority of the filmmaker. And that's something that I've really carried with me throughout the years is the authority that the person has who is editing on their computer, who's holding the camera, who's making these choices in what we see on the screen. Because we tend to trust what we see on the screen. 
if it's a documentary film, we watch it with a sense of authority. Like, ah, yes, this person at the talking head right here, they're saying this, this, and this. They have a little title under their name that says PhD and blah, blah, blah. They must be an expert, and I must listen to them. And even like the music and the tone and the way that things move, you know, like all of that is part of the artifice of documentary, which goes into the bigger ideas of fiction around documentary, which goes into is there a difference between fiction, nonfiction, narrative, documentary, hybrids? These are all obviously questions that are swirling around my head and ones that have followed me through most of my career and ones that I try to answer or at least I try to hold myself accountable to. And I wasn't going to talk too much or I wasn't going to show you too many clips because the, the videos are installed upstairs. So I'm just going to walk through some of these images and through some of these ideas that I'm thinking about. Now, in the gallery upstairs, there's a piece called I'll Remember You As You Were, Not As What You'll Become. And that very much was at the height of sort of my questions around authority and authorship through this idea of the ethnopoetic. Now, I'm going to... I'm kind of like winging it, so I'm going to slide through. I also learned how to use um, PowerPoints 20 minutes ago. Um, so please enjoy this process with me. Um, this is a calligram that I make on the wall. This is like a Ho-Chunk text. They're in the shape of effigy mounds. Um, effigy mounds, for those of you unfamiliar, are large earthen mounds that my ancestors built throughout Wisconsin that are in the shape of uh, different animals based on our clans. Um, in the late 1800s, farmers, settlers in Wisconsin, began digging them up, having picnics, or armchair archaeologists, and said that how could we have made them? It must have been some great, amazing race a thousand years ago, not these Indians right here. Which is a theme when it comes to 18th century archaeology, 19th century archaeology, 20th century archaeology. Um, and so it's just like there's a, there's a contested history where even on placards and effigy mound parks, you'll just see Native American mound. You won't see Ho-Chunk mound or Osage mound or et cetera. So it's a point of contention, and I began making calligrams in the shape of these effigy mounds using appropriated text as a form of reclamation. Uh, this is another installation view of the Hessel, and you can see a calligram on the side, which I will get to right now. Now this returns to the ethnopoetic. So this is in the shape of a bird effigy. Um, and this text is from the academic writer, Elliot Weinberger. And in the text, he essentially is saying, in, in a much more beautiful way than I could say, that what happens, or he's asking, what happens when people who traditionally have had cameras pointed at them, vis-a-vis -vis traditional ethnographic film, pick up the cameras and start pointing them at things that they want to point them at? It's all too common for anthropologists, scientists, linguists, etc., to come in and have ideas about what's important to the people that they're studying. But it's thankfully a new turn where now people are looking at the things that they want to look at, the things that are important to their culture, to their communities, to their identities, to their language, to their religions. And he, he dubs that the ethnopoetic. And I think that's a really beautiful idea. And I thought so for quite a while. And I still do. I still do. But there's something to the ethno prefix that was just kind of grating towards me in some ways. And with the film upstairs, the first one in the loop, I'll remember you as you were, not as what you'll become, is something of a confluence of, of the different feelings I was feeling about this word, where I wasn't necessarily wanting to make work that constantly responds to the ethno or centering this idea of the ethno, the ethnographic but rather ignoring that and moving away from it altogether and not having to be in a sort of defensive position or a responsive position and looking at the things that I was interested in looking at. Now this piece upstairs, it's broken up into a few different parts or has a few different elements. It opens with the calligram, such as this, that the um, anthropologist Paul Radden wrote about my tribe's religion around reincarnation. And then it, he says essentially that, you know, we weren't interested in like, you know, dying and going to heaven, happy hunting grounds, et cetera, whatever. It's just the idea, the, the ultimate form of, 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 of living was to die and to live again, to the vicissitudes of life, to the ups and downs, the things that are really terrible about living, but also the things that are really wonderful. And I found that sentiment beautiful, but I was also conflicted because I'm using this text from Paul Radden, who studied my people 100 years ago and our beliefs and things that he shouldn't have had access to. 
So there's, 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 there's a dilemma there. And so I decided to not finish reading the book that I read where I got that text from, but rather I just read the introduction because I felt that was as far as I wanted to go with it. And I put that at the beginning of the film, and the film essentially is a meditation on reincarnation. In an entirely Ho-Chunk, cosmological way, where I'm not necessarily concerning myself with Western or Abrahamic religions or Eastern religions, but just focusing on our values and our beliefs. And so the film moves, and it involves this native poet, Diane Burns, who, at the time, um, not many people had, I don't know, really remembered her. But I remembered learning or hearing this line that she wrote in 2006 or seven is when I heard it. Um, but this line of this poem, the, the, the line closes the poem, and she says, this ain't no stoic look, this is my face. And that really resonated, you know, as someone that is often told to smile or to not look so mean or to not be so stoic. And just thinking about how does my body exist in these different spaces? How do people see me? What do they expect from me? How do they not see me? And so through that film, it's just something of an elegy to Diane because she passed away, I think, just before I read, read her, her first poem or my first encounter with her work. And so it was a work that is an elegy to her, a meditation on reincarnation, and also just a movement through these different sort of planes, spectral or not, as a movement through these different landscapes. Now there's some elements in the, in the film too that I think I want to highlight. One is the opening sequence of the powwow dancers, the sort of like um, uh, sort of ecstatic light fields. Um, I was telling someone earlier, I was thinking a lot about Helen Frankenthaler and her paintings when I was making that sequence. Um, there's something about color and a sort of um, disambiguation of meaning or, a, I don't know, I'll say deterritorialization, but it is something about how can you understand something free from the signs and signifiers we bring to it. So the sequences of powwow dancers, and what I didn't want an audience to think about was powwow, because they may have been to a powwow, they may have seen natives dancing before, and with that comes biases, comes associations, comes this idea of like, I've already seen this before, I know what's going on. And so with that, I wanted to make it a bit more opaque. I wanted to have the focus be on the dancers, their movements themselves, and their outfits as they're moving around. And I wanted to remove the powwow music because that is often a clear signifier to powwow. And so I put this, um, it's called Sacred Harp, shape note singing. It's really beautiful. Um, and I became obsessed with this one song um, called Present Joys. I think it's 316 Present Joys. I mean, I just like would listen to it for days and went down many YouTube holes looking at um, Sacred Harp singers. And they have these things called conventions and they happen over the weekends, and they all gather and they sing songs all day for three days. And I was like, ah, oh, it's like a lot like a powwow. And I was reading like the uh, introduction of, or the, the welcome note on one's, one of these um, conventions websites, it was in Ireland, and they said, you don't need to be a Christian to come, you don't need to be this to come, X, Y, Z to come, just come and sing. It's welcoming, it's not denominational, it's just about being together and singing these hymns. And I thought that was really beautiful because often powwows are seen as ceremonial spaces, but they're not. They're like a neocultural sort of construction that draws different elements and are often used as a buffer between the actual ceremony things that we're trying to keep protected and to keep safe. And so like, I appreciated these different barriers, whether like, they lined up perfectly or not, and it felt natural to put this song over this powwow. It's a strange juxtaposition, but I think that it works and it really elucidates or underscores, I think, the, the, the intention of looking at people moving through these sorts of planes with their colors, with their movements, free from their bodies, free from the bodies we ascribe to them, and at the same time having this sort of like beautiful hymn that is about community and about being together. So that's what I'm hoping. Um, I just decided to click the slide because I can. Yeah. Um, I'm realizing these are a little bit out of order too. But that is a nice segue into some of the multi-channel work. I mean, this is a, a piece called Here You Are Before the Trees, um, which actually like, kind of like touches on semiotics too of history and place. Um, this is a series of photographs called The Breathings, which I began making in 2020 um, for the Hessel exhibition. As a, I don't know what I was doing with that. I recently bought a medium format camera 
and was shooting a lot and was traveling a lot just before the pandemic hit and also during the early days of the pandemic. And it was in the June of 2020 that I put text to image. Now these are about 15 inches by 15 inches. They're printed out and then I have a little Dremel tool that I etch text onto the image. You can see on the bottom it kind of goes around the top and all the way around. And these are texts that I wrote that are small little poems. There's a lot going on in June of 2020. And I was thinking a lot about how Native people exist during that time as well. Um, even just like the, the Washington Redskins finally agreeing to change their mascot. And what did it take to get there? What sort of intersectionality existed for that to happen? And also how much hurt had to happen to make that happen? It's the thing that a lot of these things are about, some of these poems that are written around the edge, is about direction, about trying to find place or location. I call them breathings because in Ho-Chunk we have a, a prayer, a prayer that we pray to the Heoka for, for direction. We call them breathings. It's like, aha, hey. And I just like thought about that during this time. Like I was like living in Wisconsin, somewhere in between moving to, to from moving from Vancouver, BC to Hudson, New York, where I live now, and just kind of like working in my friend's gallery, as a studio space, and just like trying to understand where am I going, where have I been, what has happened, and what's happening. So like I wrote these, and I made these photographs. I don't remember what they say. I'll add that in the next iteration of the PowerPoint. Little captions on the side. There's so much you can do with this thing. But they exist in these forms as a body of work. These small little prayers for a direction on these images that I took. Now in previous works, like I, I don't know, I was, I was reluctant to put my handwriting on there because it's really bad. But with these ones, I felt that's part of it where it's not necessarily about legibility. It's about the presence and intention. And like that's like a, a thing that also underscores, I think, a lot of my work, where it may be for a specific audience or someone that may understand certain references, cultural mores, etc. But that doesn't exclude a viewer from engaging with it. The things that you don't know shouldn't be barriers from bringing what you do know to the work or the interests that you have or the questions that you have. So it's, you might not be able to read my handwriting, but what I ended up doing was making the, t the, the text, the titles. So I think it's like really long titles, but it says what I say, and it's a point of access, a point of entry. I actually like this one quite a bit. Um, I don't know, there's like something about movement, there's something about space, and how these things kind of fit together. And this is a body of, of photographs that I made outside of any film, which was new. Previously, I made a series of work, and that was something that was really important for me to do um, in order to respond to the film, the photograph, and the text, and have them kind of like be an entity. But with these, these were kind of by themselves, and there was something like really freeing about that, or cathartic about that, especially during that time. No, but um, yeah, so these are etched on the photographs and they're mounted on dye bond, so there's no glass, it's, it's unglazed. And so you can kind of see like the texture, the, the text on the images as they're framed. Um, this is Fading Spells. Um, I just came across this photo the other day and I'm really proud of it. It's the Guggenheim. It's pretty cool. Um, I, just, I was thinking about this photo because this is like, again, like March 2020, where they installed a series of videos in the middle of the Guggenheim. The museum was closed. And I hadn't made a film for about a year. And I was driving down from Hudson to go to JFK to fly to see my family. I was just vaccinated and I was just like, I want to go home. And I stopped along the way to check out this installation. And it was like kind of um, a surreal moment. Like one, making something that feels so deeply personal like this film, Fainting Spells, to see it in a place that represents so many complicated things around museums and institutions, and where does that locate me, or what sort of responsibilities do I bear? 
And so I was taking those questions with me back to Washington to go see my family as I began making this film called Kicking the Clouds, which began another body of work that really is about trying to move through different, well, as I, have, as I feel like I have many different homelands, I've never made a film about Ferndale, Washington. And it's a small town of maybe 12,000 people in northern Washington, just south of the border. And that sort of exploration of like the personal, of like my personal histories, my family relationships, is something that um, follows me through so much of the things that I do and the things that I make. Now, this is a series of photographs that is a response to some of those questions that came up with Kicking the Clouds, with Fainting Spells, with All Remember You As You Were, Not As What You'll Become, and with a film called Lore, which is installed. It is, yes. Um, now this film is, I think it kind of solidifies the transition between thinking about mythology and then thinking about, I don't know, ethnography or just like what those tensions are. Now as I mentioned before, like there's you know, that tradition of, of, of you know, having to respond to the ethno, having to respond to these histories of anthropologists and ethnographers. And I began thinking about myth and where does that, what about myth? What's the deal with myth, you know? And it was, became a question that I was just like thinking a lot about because these are the stories that we have, the relationships that we have with them are through a sort of a filter of how they were documented by anthropologists in the 1900s. Now we hear a lot and we talk a lot about as Native people like the oral tradition and storytelling being a big part of our lives and our understanding of culture. But something happens when things are written down. Like that cycle stops. Like stories, the story that I would tell an audience one night, a group of people sitting around a fire one night, a people, a family, whoever, one night might change based on the next night or who's in that audience or who's in that group. And so these stories change and they adapt and they evolve their performances. And the information that they carry changes and, they, and adapts to reflect the needs of the, of the communities telling those stories. Now that cycle is interrupted when they're written down. Like I can read a story as it was told by a Ho-Chunk person 100 years ago, but what happens is I don't have access to the story in the same way. I'm viewed as less authentic, or that's viewed as the most authentic version of the story, and anything that I could say or change from here on out becomes less authentic from that authentic version. You know what I mean? It's wild. And it, it creates a distance. It, it creates a sense of like a gatekeeping like there's pr plenty of like academics and scholars who study these things, and God bless them, but who also feel that they're, they're, they're sacred objects that can't be touched by anyone else except for them. And they are sacred, but their sacredness exists in their utility, in the ways that they're reflected by a community that is telling these stories. And so I wanted to make a myth. Actually, that's why I, that's why I brought up this film. So this, this, this film, um, Fainting Spells is where I make up a myth for a plant that my tribe used to revive people that have fainted. I came across a Ho-Chunk ethnobotany text and this plant sounded beautiful. It's called a Hoiska. It's also known as Indian pipe plant and I couldn't find anything else on it and so I decided to make a myth, make a story for it. Not in a way that's part of the official Ho-Chunk canon of mythology but in a way that questions what if I made a poetic experimental film with scrolling text on the side in an abstract sort of way that focuses on this idea of transference of knowledge with a lot of images and music um, as a proposition or question of how this thing might exist. Which is, I think, one of the strengths of experimental film. It's a place for experimentation. It's a place for questioning. It's a place for ideas. And so after making that film, I made this film called Lore, which is installed here. Now, it actually began with this series of photographs which is a convoluted process, which I'll explain. So I had started taking photographs in 2017, 18 with a 35 millimeter camera. And so I had all these photographs and I got them scanned and the negative scans and so I had them on my computer. And then I printed them out on transparency paper and got one of those old fashioned overhead projectors and put it up against the wall and I cut up these photographs 
and put them on the overhead projector, photographed what the shapes on the wall, and then printed them out, and then scratched text in the bottom of them with a screwdriver as sort of failed descriptors of what was going on in these landscapes. So these are about 13 inches by 13 inches, as you can kind of see there. Um, this one is titled, These Are Dense Countries and Empty Cities. Um, this one is called, This Is Where We Left Off. This is a mnemonic for Truman Lowe. And so I'd take these photographs and, like, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a few things I was thinking through. Like, one, just a description of a landscape. Also, landscape painting, landscape photography, landscape art, the sort of history of westward expansion and where it originated. Um, this series of photographs is called The Land Describes Itself, which comes from a line of a poem by a friend. He's this, a Cherokee poet, Franklin K.R. Klein. And the last two, the, 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 the poem is called So What, but the last few lines of the poem are, why write poems about the land? The land describes itself. And that really stuck with me and really struck me in ways that, I don't know, like a lot of my work has been described as you know, dealing with the landscape, but I never know how to talk about it. And so there's just something about this idea that the land describes itself and that really struck a chord or like gave me a sense of, right, how does the land describe itself? What language is it using? How is my language reflective of that? How is the language that I know reflective of what I can hear from the land as it's describing itself? And how can these images be a way to communicate with that sort of desire or with those sorts of ideas? And I was thinking about mnemonics, which is a series of sculptures by the Ho-Chunk artist Truman Lo, who passed away right three or four years ago, who was a how to, I don't know, he was like, you know, being a young Ho-Chunk person and seeing him out in the world was just really inspiring. And I think his sculptures are really, really beautiful. I encourage you to check them out. But he has this series of, called the mnemonics, which are about these sort of like Ho-Chunk cosmologies embedded in these sculptures that he makes using birch bark, using stones, using glass, these different materials. And they're really delicate and really beautiful and just fragile in a way that points to the fragility of culture unless we utilize it. And so I made this one for him in this sort of way they're trying to combine these different elements, these sort of different, again, like signs or signifies that point to different ideas of what we represent or how people ascribe representation to us through these images or through these traditions of landscape and pastoral art. And this is the by and by. And it really became a series that I think generated a lot of ideas for me around just like one memory and also like these different sort of mediums and formats. And I was just getting ready. Actually, the show just opened in Milwaukee when I was talking to a friend and we were talking about a film by Hollis Frampton called Nostalgia. Now, in Hollis Frampton's film, what he does is he has a hot plate. It's like from 1967 or 69 or 71, you know. Um, and he has a hot plate and he places a photograph on it and over the course of five, seven minutes, the, the photograph burns away. And as you're watching it burn, you're hearing someone tell a story about a photograph that you don't see. And then after the, the, the photograph is burnt and ashed and gone, it cuts to the next shot, which is the photograph that was previously described in the last section as a new photograph that's been described that you can't see. Does that make sense? It's, I love the convoluted aspect of it, but it's also like, it's, it's, it makes sense when you see it, and it's, it's really beautiful because you're, you're hearing someone describe a photo that you're gonna see destroyed in like a minute or two, and the photograph is destroyed. And there's something about that relationship to memory and nostalgia that really I thought was beautiful. And so that really was the inspiration for making Lore, the film upstairs, along with this idea of Lore and nostalgia. As I was thinking about myth, I was thinking about what is the function of nostalgia? Like I'm tired of hearing about nostalgia as a critique. You know, it's like, ah, that's nostalgic. They're being nostalgic. That artwork is nostalgic. It's easy, you know, and it's a word that kind of means nothing or has the potential to mean all these different kind of things that we want it to mean. 
it's a wordless container. And so it was something that I was thinking about lore as part of that process. You're nostalgic for something, you tell a story, it becomes lore, it becomes folklore, it becomes a myth, and then what can you learn from that history or that story or those mistakes or the things that someone may have been nostalgic for. And it's also thinking a lot about the myth maker. Like who was the first person that may have told a myth a thousand years ago? What were they thinking or feeling? Were they going through a breakup? You know, did they lose someone? You know, just like there's like the, the humanistic aspect of mythology I think is, I'm really fascinated by. And so I was thinking about that with this film lore and this series of photographs and how they can tie together. And so in the film upstairs, lore, you know, it's like me reading this text that I wrote called Perfidia, which is where the introduction is from that I read earlier, um, along with like my hand moving these transparencies over and over the projector mixed with my friends in a band playing a song by Bo Diddley. Um, that part feels random, but it's actually, I don't know. That was when, um, it was like uh, myself, um, E.J. Hill, who's a visual artist, Fern Silva, who's a filmmaker. We were at the Radcliffe for uh, nine years, or not nine years, Jesus. Um, nine months, an academic year. And it was a very strange experience entering that place, like Harvard, you know, it's just like, do I belong there? I mean, I'm a product of like public schools, and it just felt very like I didn't belong in that space. And so it was really comforting to find other artists who felt the same way, and how we kind of built a community to help navigate the burdens and pressures of being in a space such as that. And so one of the things that we would do is like play music together, and we covered um, a song by Bo Diddley called "Heart of Manic Love," and it was just fun. And when we were all getting ready to leave, I asked if we could film that, and they said, yeah, and so I filmed us playing music together. With this idea, like, I'm gonna feel nostalgic about this in two, two years, three years, you know? And like thinking about how am I gonna feel, anticipating how am I gonna feel about this in the future is just, it's something that, I don't know, like I, I was thinking a lot about as I make films. Because even films exist outside of that oral tradition, you know? Films are, in essence, locked in stone. You know, the final cut is the final cut. They don't really change. And so what does it mean for how to engage with that memory and that process of storytelling through these works? Um, these are just some random installation views. This is at Luma Arl. You have the calligram up there and a two-channel piece in the background called Cloudless Blue Egress of Summer, which actually pulls from the Perfidio text so a part of my practice that I've really kind of begun to work through the last three or four years is poetry, photographs, and moving image, and how the three of those fit together or don't fit together. Like I'm not trying to answer all the questions through one piece of work, and so it's kind of comforting to have different avenues to have something to respond to or to respond with. And so Perfidia is a collection of poems. Lore is a film that utilizes some of those poems. The land describes itself, has the lines from the poems inscribed on the surfaces. And this piece here has some of the text scrolling across the screen. Briefly about Cloudless Blue Egress of Summer, the two-channel piece there. Um, it's about St. Augustine, Florida. And it's about boarding schools and resistance, generally speaking. Now, I got invited to do a residency at, um, at Chris Bellert Art Museum at Flagler College in St. Augustine, and when I went there, like, um, the curator, she told me that, oh yeah, Fort Marion is here, and it has a history with the boarding schools, and I was like, oh, well, what is it? I haven't heard of it before. Now, it was the place that they, the U.S. government sent a lot of prisoners of war from the Indian Wars in the late 1800s. Um, this was a prison camp. Um, and it was where Lieutenant Richard Pratt, who was the director of this place, the person in charge, was tasked with creating a sort of assimilation policy through boarding schools. And he was the person that said, it's better to kill the Indian and save the man. So we've, sure if many of you have heard some form of that quote before, um, which is really about forced assimilation. You know, the idea being that if the government has the native people's children, the native people are less likely to resist. So in essence, these children are prisoners, you know, held captive in order to encourage forced assimilation and the sort of cultural genocide. And I didn't know about that before I went there, but 
I don't know, I just, I, I have, my family has a history with boarding schools and it's just something that I never really wanted to work. I don't know, I felt like there's a lot, there's enough like conversations around this process that unless I really felt I had something to offer then I didn't really want to, I want to take some space for that. But with this project, um, there were these drawings that I came across, you don't see it in the still, but these are the drawings of ledger, ledger art. Is someone familiar with ledger art, ledger drawings? So it's just like, you know, drawings on like, you know, old ledger paper um, of scenes of war. And that's what they would do at Fort Marion. They would have the prisoners do. And a lot of them are like, you know, really famous collections of art museums all over. Speed might have some ledger drawings. Um, and there was, at the St. Augustine Historical Society, um, it's a small building and I heard that they had some, and so I went to go visit them, and I got to see them. And in a banker's box in the basement, they had these ledger drawings in these plastic sleeves. And they're all like, you know, water damaged. They were incomplete. And there were drawings of the circus. Um, because I guess one day, the soldiers took the prisoners to a circus. And so there's drawings of acrobats and horses. And they're really beautiful. And like, I don't know, there's something that really struck me about the hand that you could feel through the drawings in ways that I hadn't felt before seeing other ledger drawings. And so I made that film and like it includes more perfidia. So it's just like these like tangents, these sort of like rabbit holes that these different ideas spiral off to and so that's why I write poems and why I make films and why I take photographs and maybe I'm gonna start painting, I don't know. I hear it's easy. Um, but it's just like, it's just, there's a lot of different ways that these things connect and I'm not always certain how to connect them. And so I just try to make these different suites of work or bodies of work now that kind of explore the different possibilities of the ways that these things can be interconnected. Like I never want to overburden a film, a poem, a photograph with everything that I'm thinking about, you know? I just like kind of want to let it be or to exist in this like one note or this one point and again, see how that can fit into a broader constellation. Um, these photographs are from an installation in Berlin at Tanya Leighton Gallery that just opened last week. And so these are about 40 inches by 40 inches, or I guess like 44 by 44. And these photographs explore the sort of question around NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. And <laughs> I was tasked with taking photographs for ProPublica um, for the story that they're working on. This is an investigative story about uh, Illinois State Museums and how they, out of all the 50 states in the Union, are the ones that have repatriated the least when it comes to ancestral remains and funerary objects. Like a huge number, there's like 15,000 remains that they haven't repatriated. And so as I was thinking about that on this assignment in summer, I was just like, you know, how do these things fit together? And I, was, I had a commission from the San Jose Museum of Art that was about abolition. And like through conversations with curators, you know, just, I don't know, like, I mean, I, you know, couldn't help but think or bring up that a Native American, American Indian citizenry, like in this country began through reservations we weren't granted citizenship until 1925, and so that's like a good 30, 40 years of being on these reservations as prisoners. And so what does that mean for abolition? You know, what does that mean for how we exist as citizens in this United States, or these United States? And through that I made this piece called Sunflower Siege Engine. Um, it's, a, it's a film that, tries to combine or tries to weave together the questions I have around NAGPRA, the questions that I have around the reservation system, and the questions I have around myself as I move through this world. Like very much like, you know, my body and how I can see these things interweaving or not, or just how they're not necessarily at odds with one another, but how their continuation represents so many different lineages. I mean, even just like, you know, the, the ancestors that are in the collection of museums right now, like they're prisoners. And it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, this, this piece is something that I made that was really an attempt to 
put these ideas out there, these feelings that I'm feeling, these things I'm thinking, and trying to get a sense of like, what do I do next? So I'm going to show you an excerpt of Sunflower Siege Engine. This piece is about 12 minutes long, 13 minutes long, but this excerpt is five minutes. And just be warned, it ends with some karaoke.
It's just an excerpt. That's my last slide. We made it. Um, I guess just briefly about that piece. Um, the other elements is Cahokia. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with that, but it's a giant mound complex um, near present day St. Louis. And it again is one of those places where our history is denied in some ways. Like contemporary understandings of native people is just like, you know, we exist where we exist. And like that's where we've always existed, but like our ancestors moved through these lands, through the Ohio River Valley, through Illinois to Wisconsin, further west, and it's just all these 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 peoples and communities are interconnected in some way or another. And I don't know, the inclusion of Cahokia was an important gesture for me to make in terms of acknowledging that connection or those connections and those histories, which are very much a part of our present. But I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them or dodge them. Yeah, lots to uh, thank you, Sky. Lots to think about, um, lots to chew on and spend time with. Um, but yes, we have time for a couple of questions. If any of you have questions, I know that that was um, a sort of deep and wonderful poetic intellectual exercise and in sort of considering how Sky's practice works and exists. So let's let's turn it over to some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Sky, thank you. That was an amazing journey. I want to ask a question about. Um, Native American writers, do you have any, probably ones that are alive today, that you particularly admire or you think have authenticity? Uh, just wondering about any favorites. Sherman Alexie, for example, is one of my favorites. Oh, there's, there's plenty. Um, there's a lot of Native writers right now and before and will be. Um, as far as some names, I mean, like Louise Erdrich, I think her work is beautiful and amazing and complex and rich in ways that rival Faulkner. Um, poets like Sherwin Batsui, um, Lely Long Soldier. Um, why am I always blanking on names? I, I should like have a list on my phone. But I mean, this is, there's a lot, you know? And I'm so bad with names. What would I say about Alexi? <laughs> um, he's a complicated man that I think that complication reflects some of the challenges of being a native person living today. And I think that he's one in a long lineage of writers um, that informs a lot of how we understand native peoples. Being very diplomatic. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's just like, I think that that, that that kind of like underscores some of the things too of just like, you know, the issues that I have with like, you know, some native cinema, native art not being representative of an experience that I think is, is equally as valid or present, you know? These conversations aren't always about our suffering and our trauma and our baggage and our dirty laundry, you know? There are, they can just as much be about celebrating who is here and who's doing the work and who isn't being recognized. I mean, AWP is a really great resource for finding a lot of up-and-coming writers. Um, and as are these different journals like Canyon Books, so, or publishers. So it's just like they're out there, but it's just like with most things, you know, you, you have to do some digging if you want to find them. Other questions? Hi, Sky. Thank you so much for coming to Louisville to speak with us today. I feel so deeply inspired by your words, your experiences, and your work. And I know I'm not the only one in here that's felt like I was in a trance at certain points <laughs> listening um, to you speak today. And I think uh, for very personal reasons, um, one of my favorite parts of your talk tonight was when you were speaking about 
the documentaries that many of us have all seen and you know on different networks speaking about a lot of traumatic events that have happened in Native American history um, with colonialism and everything. One of the, my favorite parts was um, that after each point of expression, you said, and it's good, and yep, and that's great. And when you also mentioned the uh, term coexisting um, right after that, and I am wondering if you would like to answer this question. Um, how your art has impacted your, your, your ability to look at the experiences of your people, the trauma, the, you know, and, and also like form a kind of balance, if I may say, within your own experience to pay also attention to who's here now, who's doing the work, as you said. Um, has there been a journey, you know, throughout your work coming to that kind of place of coexisting where both worlds can exist at the same time? Thank you. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does, and, and thank you so much. I mean, I use an example of like um, language learning. Um, again, for this film, Wawa, like this film has seven generations of language speakers represented in the film. and. I was thinking about that in terms of like high school Spanish. You know, like I never cared where my high school Spanish teacher learned Spanish. I was never taught to care, you know? But with like language, knowing where the language that we speak comes from is very important. And just part of, it's ingrained to that language learning process. Who taught my teacher? Who taught them? Where did that dialect exist? What part of the lands? You know, like where do they come from? And just like how did I, do I explain that to my students? To teach them to teach their students? And so I think that ties into the question in ways where it's like we exist with our ancestors and we exist with our future. And it's just like something that I feel like is not innate, but it's just something that is part of the ways of not only understanding like how we exist right now in the present, but also like how we're formed by the choices that the future will have, but then also like the, the, the choices of our ancestors. And so just like, it's kind of like a strange sort of like, you know, churn of the past, present, and future that I kind of feel. And I don't like, I mean, like I mentioned like all these different questions I have with Sunflower Siege Engine, with repatriation, with abolition, with reservations, with myself. Like I don't, I, I, the way that I try to make sense with that in my head is to make a video, you know? Like this is like my medium. Like making photographs, writing poems, making, experimental film installations, whatever, you know, just shooting with a camera, editing on a timeline, like that's the thing that I do to help me process these different things. You know, it's like that's, that's similar in, in similar ways where I feel like, like I teach, you know, and anyone that teaches know that it sucks up a lot of your time. Um, there's just a lot of different concerns, whether it's like grading students, one's mental health, one's practice, they have to balance. And it's just like when I step away from editing or shooting for a long time and I get back to it, it's just like, oh, right, this is the thing that I do. Same thing like what I feel when I'm not around Native people for a while, you know? Like that film, Dislocation Blues, that I talked about in the beginning about Standing Rock, you know? Just like there was, Dislocation comes from the title of just like our drive 10 hours from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, going to Standing Rock, and it's like a 10 hour drive straight through, and it's just like a very liminal space, and it's just feeling at home a bunch with a lot of Native people, but then also I feel like my friends are mostly white in this grad program, and it's just like, how do I balance that? And I just continually feel dislocated. So, in ways like, you know, the history and these different sort of traditions, whether they're poetic, whether they're literary or, or filmic, or even cultural and religious, like, those are the things that are grounding or anchoring points that, I don't know, that kind of tries to help me navigate these different sorts of places and even these different sort of, I don't know, ways of coexisting with not only other natives, but just other marginalized people that are attempting to answer or ask the same or similar questions in these different locations that weren't necessarily made for us, but they're built on top of places that were made for us, you know? So just different strata, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question. But. One more question. Maybe there was somebody over here that had a question. 
thank you for sharing that. And it, uh, you know, my question kind of goes along with the other two questions, you know, about kind of your experiences. And I know that I hear stories about my family and, and kind of what they have gone through and that. And, uh, but uh, my question is, what actual experiences have you encountered or, or, or what inspires you, what experience inspires you to do the work that you have done. Again, we've heard stories. I, you know, again, I hear stories, and that does inspire me. But is there uh, a particular experience, something that has happened to you, that inspired you to do the work that you do? And it's incredible work. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've lived a lot of life, you know. And I think that's kind of like is just part of that history or just my experience isn't unique, you know? It's a lot of movement. It's a lot of just like trying to understand how I fit in. It's a lot of falling between the cracks, to be honest, you know, whether it's like academically or socially. I mean, it took me like 10 years to get my undergraduate degree, you know? I used to be ashamed of that, but I'm kind of proud of that now, you know? Went to four different community colleges, one tribal college, finally one uni state university, and then got my MFA from another state university. So it's just like a lot of twists and turns, a lot of failing, a lot of you know finding native communities along the way, finding non-native communities along the way, a lot of I don't know failed attempts at trying to follow my passions, which I guess never failed. You know, it's all good. There it is. <laughs> But I don't know, I mean, it's just, like intergenerational trauma is talked a lot about, epigenic trauma is talked a lot about. And like, I mean, the sort of like, substrat of that is just like knowledge, you know, intergenerational knowledge and care and community and ways of being, you know, just like for all the things that hurt, there's also a lot of refuge in these ties and in these binds that, that, that connect us to either land, culture, or family. And sometimes we seek them out and sometimes we run away from them. And I feel like I've done both. But I don't know. I feel like, I mean, a lot of the work is a synthesis of the places that I've been and the ways that I've tried to make sense of the world. So I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of answering questions. You're doing great. Um, who has the time? <laughs> okay, so you all, if you feel so inclined, you have 10 minutes. <laughs> to run upstairs and see these films that are on view. Um, otherwise, please come back during the museum's open hours. Sundays are always free. Um, and spend some time in these galleries. But uh, let's all give a big thank you hand to Sky. Thank you.